evening. And then uh, Wednesday uh, at 7, uh, we are having, is it Zoom, Pastor Matt? Yeah, okay, so Zoom meeting, uh, Bible study, and we're going to be using our starting a series, Always Rejoicing. It's a verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Philippians, so I hope you can be able to join in on that. So that's Zoom on Wednesday at 7. And then this week uh, on my podcast, and actually for a number of weeks, probably six or seven uh, weeks, uh, I'm going to be examining the errors of Calvinism and Arminianism. And uh, so a little interesting study for you to check out on my podcast, and it's definitely something that you need to be aware of, and the truths and the errors, so I hope you can uh, partake in that. And then uh, Saturday, 8.30, uh, is our Facebook devotion, and Pastor Matt will be bringing us a word on Saturday. So now we know there's some new res uh, restrictions coming in and things starting tomorrow. Uh, so, But next Sunday, we're not going to change anything in a sense of time. Uh, me and Pastor Matt are pretty much done pre-recording, all right? So we are going to be here at 9 a.m., and I'm going to preach, or Pastor Matt's going to preach, whatever Sunday it is. And uh, we got a number of folks who are going to need to be here to uh, run the machines and everything like that. Uh, but if you are interested in coming, email the church. We're not going to exceed the 10, but we're allowed to have 10. So if you want to come, uh, we'll let you know if we have room for you on that Sunday. Uh, so obviously not everyone can come at one time, uh, but it's, it's, that's what we're going to do. Church needs to be open, and it's essential. We need to be here, so we'll follow the guidelines of the numbers, even though personally I think it's a little ridiculous. That's as far as I'm going to go with that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, just email us if you want to be here, and then we'll touch base with you. We'll let you know long enough be ahead of time. We won't text you Sunday morning at 7, be at church, or anything like that. But uh, we'll let you know, and that way uh, someone will be here, and we'll be preaching, and we'll have someone to preach to. Maybe it'll just be service just for you and everyone else online, all right? Uh, but we look forward to that opportunity. Uh, and then uh, we'll st still have our Faith Bible Institute coming up in uh, June, uh, and it's about uh, to find... Uh, Defining and uh, defending a biblical worldview, and registration early registration is May the third. Uh, so get that in to uh, Brother Roger uh, as soon as you can. If you get any questions, please do contact him. And uh, if you are interested in being involved or being in that class, you just I don't know if I get the money. Uh, please touch base with us. We want to help. We got some sponsorship available uh, to help you do it. And I know you'll be encouraged. I'm going to tell you right now. You need to know what the Bible says about worldview. You need to know. Uh, the world tries to tell us, but that's not the Bible. Uh, so we need to know. So let me encourage you to be involved. And if uh, you can't be here, it's okay. If you can't come to class, depends what our restrictions are and things at the time. Uh, you'll be still be able to watch it at home. That's not going to change. Uh, so we'll make sure of that. Uh, and if you're graduating high school, uh, institute, college, university, trade school, whatever school, uh, please let us know. We're going to take a Sunday in June to honor you. Uh, so I know there's some people graduating, but they still haven't told me. I mean, I'm really upset that you wouldn't tell a pastor that you're, no, I'm not upset, but I know some of you are. So please do let us know. We want to make sure we honor you, all right? And then those, uh, you know, if you're giving the church, we're so thankful for your giving. Continue the uh, e-transfer uh, tithely. If you're coming by, you can drop it off in the box on Sunday or in the mailbox outside. Uh, just let us know about that so uh, we can bring it in and put in safekeeping. And then uh, if you do need to talk to anybody, uh, myself, Pastor Matt are available. We're here at the office during the week. A phone call, you need to face-to-face, -face, we'll do that as well. And uh, no problem uh, with that. We want to be an encouragement to you at this time. And uh, I'm going to pray in just a moment. I'm going to do something a little different here this morning. Uh, for one, I, I think it's really important that we need to be praying for our leaders. And then as well... We need to be praying for our healthcare professionals. Uh, it's not a lie that our hospitals are full and they have to take care of sick people. And they're facing a lot of strain and we need to pray for them. And in our own church family, I know there's uh, health perf healthcare professionals and we're so thankful for each and every one of them. So we'll be praying for them in just a moment. And as well, I wanted to mention, I know I sent out an email earlier this week about Dr. Burge and uh, just just seems that uh, the days are short for Dr. Burge here on this earth, uh, just with his health and things, and uh, he's gathered all his family there with him there in Florida now as well, uh, kind of saying their goodbyes and things, and uh, 
Let's just be a prayer for the Burgess, uh, a couple that really have made a huge impact in so many churches. They've impacted our church and so many folks here, um, and they've impacted missionaries all around the world uh, and missionaries who are going to the field and things. Uh, so let's just be in prayer for them. I met the Burgess in 1998. I was working at uh, New Testament Baptist Church, a uh, youth director thing there. I don't know if I actually had a title, but I was working with the teenagers, and I got to meet them there for the first time. It was uh, touched by their heart for missions and to reach the people, reach folks with the gospel, and uh, I really do appreciate their impact in my life. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you uh, for so many things you've blessed us with. I think of the Burges right now, Lord. I pray that you'd be with Dr. Burge and Lord, what a fantastic testimony of how he's loved you and desired that folks would come to know you and encourage missionaries who go forth, who reach more folks for the gospel, his dear wife. And Lord, uh, it does appear that these are the final days for him here on this earth, and uh, we're so glad for the reality of heaven. And Lord, I pray that you would just encourage their hearts, be with Mrs. Burge in a great way, in his family. Lord, we're thankful for uh, those who serve us, uh, for our leaders of our land. Lord, I pray that you would give them clarity of mind, sound judgment and counsel. Uh, Lord, they need it. Lord, how the, help them to uh, take it and apply it in our, in our country, in our province. And Lord, I pray for uh, those who serve us day in and day out, our healthcare professionals, uh, Lord, who are indeed dealing with so many sick uh, in our hospitals right now, Lord, I pray that you would put your hand of mercy upon them, protect them uh, from the sicknesses as well, and uh, Lord, allow them to continue to have the heart of mercy uh, and compassion for these folks who are going through terrible times. And Lord, what a blessing it is to have folks like that in our church. And Lord, I pray you just encourage them in a massive way. Know that we love them and we care for them. And Lord, I pray you just be with them now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen. Does Jesus care? Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Because if his eyes is on the spiral, I know he watches us, right? Amen. Let's sing, I'd rather have Jesus. 554. On the first. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches and told. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by His name. Number two, Ephesians chapter number two. <clears throat> That's a great song. I love all the songs we sang this morning, uh, but the eye is on the sparrow. I, I'm not a bird person. I don't know much about the fowl of the air, but a friend of mine who's a pastor, he told me that uh, a significant thing about sparrows. He told me there are sparrows in every continent. It doesn't seem like much when he told me, but then I thought, well, his eyes on the sparrow, so his eyes upon me. He knows my needs, so every continent there's sparrows. Yeah, you see the worldwide reach of that view. He knows why he knows a sparrow when it falls, so he knows you. Man, that's an amazing thing, and uh, it's a blessing. That's just from the song, and we haven't even started preaching yet. All right, Ephesians chapter two, and we're starting verse number one in a moment. Uh, the last time we looked at Ephesians, we looked at chapter one, and we saw the possessions in Christ, and now in this chapter. We're going to see our spiritual position in Christ. And uh, he, first of all, Paul begins to explain uh, what God has done for sinners. And, that, and then he explains what, you know, that the sinner who trusts in Jesus Christ has been raised and seated uh, on the throne or next to the throne with Christ. And uh, what a miracle God's grace is. He's taken us out of the great graveyard of sin. And he's placed this in the throne room. 
What an amazing God. So Ephesians chapter number 2, and starting verse number 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, and His great love wherewith He hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and have raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace, in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, Lord, help us this morning. Help us to know your salvation, Lord, first and foremost, that we have accepted you as Savior. And then if we have made that great decision that we are following you and we are living a life that points others to your great grace. Lord, I pray you bless this service now in Jesus' name. Amen. So <clears throat> we see a number of things here. Paul gets right to the point here. He says uh, in the first three verses, he's talking about or gives us a picture of our spiritual condition of, as an unsaved individual, okay? And it's not nice. First of all, he's dead. A sinner is dead. This means spiritually dead, that he's unable to understand and appreciate spiritual things. He possesses no spiritual life, and he can do nothing of himself to please God. Now, that in itself is contrary to what a lot of religions teach today. They say we can get to God through our good works. All right, but he, he tells us here on, on a, with great clarity that you can't. A, a, a person who is physically dead does not respond to physical stimulus. It's not possible. He's unable to hear or she's unable to hear. Doesn't, doesn't know what's going on in the funeral home. Has no appetite, cannot drink, uh, feels no pain because they're dead. They're dead. And so with the inner man of the unsaved, they're dead. His spiritual uh, faculties are not functioning. They cannot function until God gives him life, amen? That's the way it works. And because of the spiritual death uh, is in trespasses and sins, the wages of sin is death. In the Bible, death basically means separation, Okay, uh, not only physical, I mean the spirit leaving the body, we know that takes place at death, but as, also spiritually, when if we haven't accepted Christ as Savior, we're eternally separated from God. Our spirit is separated from God. The unbeliever, so you're going to hear this from our world, that you know, sinners, they won't call them sinners, but people are sick, right? It's a sickness. Listen, a sinner is not sick, he is dead, he is dead. So the idea is that a, a sinner does not need resuscitation, doesn't need CPR. He needs resurrection. That's what he needs. He needs to be resurrected. A lost sinner is dead. And the only difference between one sinner and another sinner is decay. We could go just about any major city. You don't have to go to a major city anymore and find what you would call skid row. Individuals who are chained to addiction, alcoholism, uh, it's sin, that's what it is. They're chained to it, and they're in greater states of decay, aren't they? They're in greater states, uh, states of decay than the socialite who looks good, it's got a nice car, you know, trying their best. They're still sinners. If they don't know Christ, don't know Christ as a uh, Savior, they're lost. So it's just a difference in the state of decay. They're still dead in their sins. So not only is he dead, the sinner is dead, he's disobedient. Verses 2 and 3, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 
This was the beginning of man's spiritual death. Disobedience is what got us here. Right? Let's remember it. We talk about history, and I've new, mentioned numerous times in this past year how I've been upset to see how history, our, you know, past of our country, secular history has been torn down. Hey, we need to remember the history of sin. It was where the, the Lord said, In the day that thou shalt eat, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 7. But then Satan comes along and says, Ye shall not surely die. And the first man and woman believed the lie. And they experienced immediate spiritual separation, didn't they? You know, they were separated from God, and eventually they faced that physical death. And since that time, mankind, everyone has, has lived in a disobedience to God. And there's forces that encourage men and women today to disobey. Our world system, first of all. Our world. It puts on, it preaches a message of, uh, of you know, do what you want, uh, you know, just do whatever you want, and, and puts pressure on them to conform to their way of thinking. Even though at the same time they say, be your own self, be your own self, but be like us. Do you see that in the world today? Be yourself, but be like us. It's contradictory, isn't it? You know, they, they, the, the world system is, is uh, to be like us. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. They may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jesus Christ was not of this world, and his people should not be either. Those who follow Christ. The unsaved individual, consciously or unconsciously, you know, is controlled or looks to the values and attitudes of this world for, its, for his guidance. And, and the devil is involved as well. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, this, I'm not trying to say, because it's not possible, Satan is not at work in every individual's life. He is bound. He's a created being. He's not God, though he wants to be God. He, he can't be everywhere at one place. He is powerful, but he's not like God. Uh, but he has those under his realm as such, the uh, demonic world associates who uh, work in this world system. Um, and what John 12, 31 talks about now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Satan desires, uh, along with his minions, to influence the lives of the unbeliever greatly. And he looks to put pressure and influence upon the believer as well. He can't take a believer from God but he can try to take them down in a sense of testimony and witness and things of that nature. And then our flesh encourages the unbeliever to disobey God. That's what's found in verse 3, among all, whom also we had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Now by a flesh, Paul did not mean your fingers and your toes are opposed to God. Okay? That's not what he's talking about. You know, the body itself is, he's talking about the nature of man, who we are. We're born with the sin nature, with flesh. And that flesh wants to control the body and the mind, and it controls us to most often disobey God, do our own thing. And why does a sinner act like a sinner? Because that's our nature. Uh, Psalms 51, 5, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. But that, we have a sinful nature. It's a flesh. Is it any wonder that unsaved person is disobedient to God? It's, it shouldn't be a wonder, because that's his nature. And uh, we can't change, or that individual cannot change his nature or overcome this world and the things that are said about, about him. He needs outside help, and the outside help is Jesus. That's the outside help. And he's greater than all. You know, the lost sinner lives to please the flesh and the wishes of the mind. We see that in verse number three. His actions are sinful. His appetites are, are wrong. And Jesus says the lost sinners do do good to each other, though. In Luke chapter 6, verse 33. And if you do good to them, which do good to you, what well, thank have ye, for sinners even do the same. Okay, so the reality is, Sinners do do good. They, they're nice. Uh, in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, and they do good to their children. 
but they can't do anything that pleases God because they're dead in their trespasses and sins. Uh, think about Paul. Paul was journeying uh, to Rome and his ship got shipwrecked. And it landed on the Isle of Mal uh, uh, Malta. And there, the individuals helped. They saved someone from shipwreck. Isn't that, they deserve a medal for that. That they saved someone from a shipwreck. That is a very good work. And they went even beyond that. They gathered wood and food, and they made a fire to warm people. You can find this story in Acts chapter 28. They were, they were generous. They were nice people. But they still needed to be saved. They still needed to be saved. The sitter is doomed by the nature of our sin, okay, because of our sin nature, and of the mind, and we're by nature the children of wrath. Oh, by disobedience, we, we are there. Unsaved person is condemned. John 3.18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The sentence has been passed. It's been brought down. But by God's mercy, there is a stay in the execution of that. God gives an opportunity for man to be saved, because then the next verse is great, whereby the nature of the children of wrath, even as others, but God... But God. We see that now God gets involved. Uh, so we see verses 4 to 9, God's work for us. God's work for us. The focus of a salvation, or of, of, of the, uh, the tension of this scripture now focuses on God, not on sinful man. Salvation is of the Lord. That's found in Jonah chapter 2, verse 9. We are reminded of our things of, from God that he did on behalf of sinners. He loved us. Who's rich in mercy for his great love, where he loved us. God is love, amen? He's love. Uh, that's who he is. That's part of his very being. The theologians, and I totally agree with them, call love one of God's attributes. When God's love is related to sinners, it becomes grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. God is rich in mercy and in grace. And these riches make it possible for a sinner to be saved. And as I was studying out this message this weekend, this, this really struck home to me, and some people get this all mixed up. You'll be shocked to know that we're not saved by God's love, but we're saved by God's mercy and His grace. But it is an indication of His love. Because our world just thinks on God's love. God loves me. He wouldn't do that. And I mean, no, listen, it's by His grace and mercy you can be saved. And again, it's just a showing of his love, but we need to remember that. In his mercy, he does not give us what we deserve. I'm sure there's been times in your life when you have to deal with someone and they deserved a harsh uh, whatever it was, and you were merciful. You didn't give them what they deserved. And that's with God. He's grace, or his mercy, sorry. He does not give us what we deserve, and his grace gives us what we do not deserve. He does not give us what we deserve, mercy and grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. He's gracious. I've done things for people, never desiring to receive anything, but they were very gracious and they did do something for me. That's grace. Or maybe I haven't done anything <laughs> and they were gracious and they gave me something. That's grace. All this made possible because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It was at Calvary that God displayed his hatred for sin, right? He hates sin, but his love for sinners through that grace and mercy. God loves us. That's why he provided Jesus Christ. He quickened us. He made us alive, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. This means he made us alive, even then when we were dead in sins. And he accomplishes this spiritual resurrection by the power of the Spirit using the Word. In the Gospels, there's recorded for us three people that Christ rose from the dead. Now, I think all of you know right now, one of them is Lazarus. You can go, oh, I know one, Lazarus. I mean, I've, I've been sitting in the pew in time, and the pastor says something, goes, oh, I know one of those things, I know one of those. So it's Lazarus. The other one was the widow's son. And then the third 
was Jairus' daughter. You know, in each case, he spoke the word and it gave life. He spoke the word. He didn't make a potion. He spoke the word. The word of God is quick and powerful. These physical resurrections are pictures of the spiritual resurrection that comes to the sinner when he hears the word and he believes in Jesus Christ. Uh, and our spiritual resurrection is, is wonderful, it's amazing, and then it puts us in union with Christ. Now are we resurrected from the dead from our spiritual death. Now we're resurrected and made alive together with Christ. As members of his body, we're united to him. Uh, we see that in Ephesians chapter 1, and uh, we're sharing his resurrection and power. We saw that in Ephesians chapter 1 as well. He exalts us in verse 6, and he raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're not just raised from the dead and left in the graveyard. No way. Because we're, once we're saved, we're united with Christ, and he's exalted uh, us to share in the heavenlies in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. If that, should, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. That, that's, our, that's our position right now, though we're not there and that we can see it in God's mind, positionally, that's where we're at. That's wonderful. That should give us a great deal of encouragement. In verses 7 to 9, we see that he keeps us God's purpose in redemption, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God's purpose in our redemption is not simply to rescue us from hell, even though that would be great enough, wouldn't it? But that's not it. That's, just, that's not where it ends. His ultimate purpose in our salvation is that for eternity we glorify, we worship, we spend with him. With him. So if God has an eternal purpose for, to fulfill, if he has an eternal purpose for us to fulfill, which he says in his word, he will keep us for eternity, amen? That's his plan. And we should be excited about that. And since we're not saved by our good works, right? We, we're not saved by our good works. The word that this verse tells us is not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved by our works. We can't be lost by our bad works. We all on occasion, every, every individual, every Christian does bad things on occasion. Sometimes as we get in a bit of a rut and we do it more than we ever want to. But we do things that we shouldn't do. We sin. So we never have to worry that our sin, we shouldn't desire to sin. It shouldn't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm going to do a, I'm going to be a really bad Christian today. Right? That's not how we think. Okay, that's not the way we operate. But if we do have bad days and we do things that we shouldn't do, we're not lost because our works never saved us. Jesus Christ did. That's how it's based. Grace being salvation complete apart from any merit or work on our behalf that we have done. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift. It's not a reward because we've been good. It's a gift given to us. Salvation cannot be of works. Because the work is done, amen? The work's completed. What Jesus Christ did on the cross is the finished work. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken away from it. It's complete. Forever complete. It doesn't need an upgrade. It doesn't need to be added, you know, 2.1 or any of that foolishness. It is perfect for eternity. And when Jesus died, that veil was torn, signifying the way to God was now open. No need of any more sacrifices. It was finished. God did it all, and he did it by his grace. Sin worked against us, but God worked for us. Verse number 10, we see God labor in us. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. So when we come to the point where we understand that we're lost, that you were headed to a crisis eternity, so one day I was going that way, I realized I was a sinner, I realized because of my sin I was heading to a crisis eternity, but God paid a price through Jesus Christ. And I accepted his gift of salvation, and I was saved. All right, At that moment of conversion, that's not where it ended. Right? 
just because I got saved, I, I, I got converted, that's just the beginning. It's not the end. It's not the end, Christian, of just accepting the gift of salvation, which is awesome, it's amazing. I'm not downplaying that for a moment. But there's so much more. We are part of God's new creation. And God continues to work in us to make us what he wants us to be. Because when we get saved, God's got a way bigger plan for us. Sometimes we think this is enough. This is, this is just the beginning point. You know, and we're so much more that God has played out for us. But how does God work in us? So whoever you are sitting, how does God work in you? Well, there's a number of ways he's going to do that through his Holy Spirit, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. Christ is equipping us for his work, for our work here on the earth. He uses the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we receive the word of God, when you hear of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. The word of God is for us to help us to do what God wants us to do. Prayer. We need to be in prayer. And we'll look at that more in Ephesians chapter 3 down the road. And there's another part. It's challenges, suffering, life. That helps us in our growth with the Lord. As we read God's Word, oh, and I will say, if you didn't get a chance to see uh, the Wednesday night Bible study, I would encourage you to go and see that. Uh, it's on Facebook. It's all about studying God's Word. All right? Study God's Word. As we study God's Word, as we meditate therein, uh, we understand, uh, we are, get a better grip of who God is, and then we are in prayer, and we... Uh, as we read God's Word in prayer, uh, I don't know if this is, I certainly hope this has happened to you. As you are reading God's Word and you're meditating therein, you're like, oh boy, I've made a boo-boo. I have done something wrong. I need to get it fixed. Or I read God's Word and says, hmm, and I'm in prayer, I need to do this. This, this is what, this God's Word is, the principle or whatever it is, is there. I need to do that. Okay, so it's, it's helping us grow in our walk. And then, life. Sometimes life is really, really, really difficult. It's not fun. It's hard. There's suffering. Uh, there's pain. There's challenges. It's hard. And you know what that happens? Hey, we've been through a crazy wild 14 months. Right? It's been crazy. And I've seen this cycle in so many lives from people talk to me, uh, you know, sit down in my office, we're on the phone, and they say, Pastor, I've been hurting, and you know what it's done? It's drove me back to God. It's drove me back to God, His Word, and in prayer, and then the cycle repeats. We learn from it. We, we, we apply new principles, or they're not new, but new to us maybe, or we've forgotten them. And we apply those to our lives, and it helps us grow. Too many Christians think conversion is the only important thing or important experience, and that is thawed thinking. That, that, that's not right. That's not the way it works. The resur resurrection power that saved you and me, if we know Christ as Savior, took us out of the graveyard of sin, is going to help us grow in His grace. It's just not for salvation. Though that is amazing. I'm not downplaying that. It is a marvelous thing. But it's there to help us serve Him. And we can look in God's Word and see these principles play out. I think of Moses. Moses. God spent 40 years working in Moses before he could work through him, you know. Uh, he was arrogant at first, you know, and uh, he depended upon his own strength. He uh, killed an Egyptian, and then he fled the scene, right? He fled, he fled Egypt. Then he went to the wilderness. And, uh, you know, he was a shepherd. Can you imagine how humbling that must have been? Just think about it. When he was in Egypt, he wasn't a shepherd, Right? He was in Pharaoh's house. Pretty sure you can get eggs and bacon every morning in a Pharaoh's house, okay? 
for breakfast. Then he goes to the desert, the wilderness, and he's herding sheep. I'm sure there's some unique beauty in the desert too, but you know, it's a lot different. A lot different. And there the Lord worked on him for 40 years. And then God said, all right, now you're ready to do my work. And boy, did he do God's work. God has a work for us. He works in us. And then he works through us. God's endeavor through us. Uh, verse, latter power, verse number 10. Unto uh, Jesus Christ, or for we are his works, been created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're not saved by good works, but we're saved unto good works. So I, I, I could do all the nicest, bestest. I could save everyone who was ever shipwrecked, like the people in Malta did with Paul, and that's not going to save me. But once I'm saved, I'm saved to do good works. That should be my desire. That should be your desire as a Christian. And that there's that basic scripture, scriptural theme is found in James chapter 2 where the writer points out that the saving faith always results in a changed life. You're not the same. It's not enough to say that I have faith. We must demonstrate our faith by our works, how we live. And the works Paul writes about in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, have two special characteristics. First, they're good. They're good works in contrast to the works of, uh, of uh, darkness and wicked words, and works uh, that we find in our portion of Scripture. And in contrast to 2.10 and 2.2, where we see that the unbeliever has Satan working in him, and therefore his works are not good. But as believers, we have God working in us, and therefore our work works should be good. Good works. You know, uh, that should be my desire. Uh, his works, that individual believer's works are not good because... He is good himself, but because we are new creatures, amen? That's where the, the good works come from, is through our Lord. And the new nature is working in us. The Holy Spirit is, is prodding us along. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you right now, the more you are in tune with God, the more you're in His Word, the more that you're in prayer and you're looking to Him to help, you just get that more lasered focus on doing what is right, and the Lord opens opportunities galore. And I'm not talking about opportunities to go all the way around the world. I'm talking about opportunities to do works right here. I, I, can't, I know I've relayed this message or this statement a few times to you, but the reality is just being in prayer and following the Lord's leading has opened the opportunity for me so many times to send a message to someone, and they reply, Pastor, you don't know how much that means. I have no idea what you're going through at the moment. All I know, I prayed for you that morning, and the Lord kind of prompted, through the Holy Spirit prompted me, hey, send him a message. I don't hear any audible voices. There's nothing spooky. All right? It's just a little prodding in the heart. Send him a message. And I've done it, and I, and I still am surprised. I guess the surprise is that God uses me. All right? He uses me. He uses you. And it's just to see the response and... And I'm, I know I've responded to some folks say, well, the Lord put you on my heart. And he has. And, that, and that's just a really small example. We need to be uh, laser focused for the Lord and he'll open up opportunities. And it's too bad that so many individual believers minimize the place of good works in our hearts and lives as Christians. And again, good works don't save us and they don't keep us safe because it's all finished. We're in Christ. But good works is an amazing opportunity to be a testimony. Let your light so shine before men, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We don't perform the good works. I don't send a text so you to glorify me. No, it's to glorify the Lord. And I'm glad I'm an encouragement to you. Praise the Lord, but give God the glory for it. That's the whole idea. And it's important that we understand that we're not manufacturing the good works. This is the result of God working in our hearts. It is in God which worketh both in to do will and to do his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. The secret of our good works, the secret of Paul's good works, was, is the grace of God. It's the grace of God. Our good works are evidence 
that we are born again. That we are born again. And our good works are also a testimony to the lost. You know, if we, are, if we serve the lost with good works, it opens up opportunities to testify and give the gospel in so many ways. I'm not saying that that's the way it always has to be, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you are a good neighbor, it's so much easier to witness about Jesus Christ than if you're a crooked old neighbor. You know, you're not the neighbor like, you parked on the driveway, you, I'm, I'm going to phone the cops on you. I know that's a bit of an exaggeration, but sometimes we can get in that mindset where we're really critical and we're not very forgiving and we have a, you know, we're having a bad day and that guy parked just too far. Oh, yeah, that's not going to really help, Brace. It sure does help when you say, hey, hey, man, can I help you? Can I mow your grass? I don't, sometimes don't even tell my neighbor I'm going to mow his grass. I just mow it for him anyway. Hey, I haven't met too many neighbors who get upset about that. I'm sure there's a couple who really love to do it. But, you know, the idea is that you, use your, you do good works. It's in the Bible, folks. Again, it doesn't, it's not a saving factor. It's a product of being saved. Doing good works. I'll give you an example. I read about this this week. A, a lady was a, uh, visiting a retirement home next to her house. Uh, she did it for a long time. One day she walked in and she saw an elderly gentleman sitting at the table, kind of staring at his plate of food. And uh, she said, is there something wrong? It was, you know, he had a bit of a stern look as he was looking at his plate of food. And, is there something wrong, she said. And he replied uh, with uh, an accent, yes, there's something wrong. This is, I'm a Jew, I can't eat this food. It doesn't meet my dietary needs, you know. And she said, uh, well, what, what would you like to have? What could you have? And he went on to tell her, I would love a big bowl of hot soup. And so she left and went home, made that soup, and uh, asked for permission from the office, and they gave it. And, and she brought that big bowl of soup to him and did it numerous times. And every time his face would beam. I mean, he's this guy's not man after my own heart. If someone brings me food, you're in my good books forever. All right. Uh, and uh, so he's loving this, and eventually over time, because of her good work, she led that man to Jesus Christ over a bowl of soup. Do good. Do good unto those around you. And these are prepared. God's works, uh, works which God had prepared before ordained, as prepared that we should walk in them. You know, the, the unbeliever walks around uh, according to this world, the course of this world. But the believer uh, walks God's way, and God has prepared good works for that believer to do. All believers, he's prepared us. I can think of a time when we were on deputation, me and my wife, and uh, we were going to Newfoundland, and we were out in Alberta. And this guy had us come to his restaurant, and we sat down, had a big breakfast, and then he gave us 100 bucks. Didn't make me pay and give me 100 bucks. Who doesn't like to go to that kind of restaurant, amen? You know? And he, the God had ordained that man to do that good work. God's, I'm not saying that that's what you have to do, but God is putting opportunities before you. Do them. It means that God has a plan for our lives, and that we should walk in his will and fulfill his plan. And Paul's not talking about an impersonal fate that controls our life no matter uh, what you may or may not do. No, he's talking about the gracious plan of a loving Heavenly Father who wills the very best for us. Do you believe that God wants the very best for you? Do you believe that? I mean, I don't want you to say it out loud or anything. I want you to know it for sure. He does. He wants the very best for you. And the will of the Lord, uh, will of God comes from the heart of God. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. When we discover God's will for our lives, when we understand it, and I'm going to tell you right now, God's will is not mystical. You don't have to go in, in, into a dark closet for three or four days to figure it out. I've already told you some things that God wants you to do. He wants you to be in his word. He wants you to be in prayer. You know, that, that's... That's God's will for you to do those things. He wants you to, to, to do good works. Hey, I'm telling you some more. Uh, so follow God's will. And I'm telling you, it's going to be amazing. 
It's exciting to see what God has for us. But we need to be willing to follow. We need to be willing to follow. And I think that's a big problem for a lot of Christians is, I'm so busy. I have so many things on the go. Well, I understand we have things on the go, but don't let the things on the go stop you from doing good works unto all men. No, let's, let's be serving. And the greatest portion of Scripture, verses 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and now yourselves is the gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. That is the great decision. You need to make that decision. You need to accept Jesus Christ as Savior before you can do good works unto all men that will matter to God. Okay, we, you need Christ as Savior. And He'll change your life. It's not by what you've done right now or what you will do. It's through His finished work. Trust Christ. You come to him, he won't turn you away. He won't turn you away. I, just this week, we were talking about, uh, we were doing some work in our garage. I don't know how the conversation came up, uh, but we were coming back from Newfoundland and uh, from our family trip. There was in 2017, and it was pouring raining. I did not want to set up the tent in pouring rain. And there was, I guess, a bunch of other people who were thinking the same thing. And we were running from one hotel to the next trying to get the hotel rooms. And we were always getting beef. You know, and then we got really mad at my wife. She let this family go in first. She opened the door first. We're like, don't open the door for anybody. You know, we were being really good Christians, right? And they got the room. And then we ended up in this dump of a motel room. Oh, it was horrible. But at least we weren't rained on. But the idea, folks, is that we take the opportunity to follow the Lord and let him use us. Let him, use, let him use us. And, and he, we got turned away from all those hotel rooms. You come to Christ the one time, and he won't turn you away, amen? You come to him, and he won't turn you away. Are you enjoying the liberty in Jesus Christ, believer? Are you? As a Christian, you've been raised and seated on the throne, next to the throne. We saw that in the scripture we saw this morning. Practice your position. Practice it. Practice it. Practice your position. He has worked for you. Now let him work in you and through you. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you'll be amazed. You will be amazed how he does that. You'll stand, sit back in a couple years or a couple days and say, Lord, I can't believe you used me that way. Thank you, Jesus. But we have to be willing. Dear Jesus, thank you for your word. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that anyone who's watching, who doesn't know you as Savior, anyone who is here doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, they would make that great decision for you. Lord, it's nothing that they could ever do. There's no works that will earn it. There's no works that will keep it because it's all been purchased by your blood. You are the perfect sacrifice. You gave so we could have salvation. And Lord, I pray that they would accept you as Savior. And Lord, I pray for us as individual believers and those watching, those here who have made that choice. We have accepted you. Lord, help us to follow you. Help us not just to be content that we've made that great decision and oh, we're so glad we have, but there's so much more besides being converted, there's, there's a life to serve you and others. Lord, help us to look for opportunities to serve each other as brethren and to serve and do good works unto the lost that we can show them your great salvation. Lord, I pray these things in your holy and precious name. I'm going to ask every head to be bowed just for a few more moments. Michelle's going to play. Just ask the Lord to work in your heart. Maybe there's someone in your life right now that you need as a believer to reach out to. Show them some good works. Show them that you love them. Show them God's love. Maybe you're watching, maybe you're here and you don't know Christ as Savior. That, my friend, is the greatest decision you can ever make. Don't put it off. Do it now. Put your faith and trust in Him and Him alone.
Thank you for being with us online and in, in person here. And if you do have any questions about the message, please don't hesitate to reach out if online. If you're here, please do talk to me after. Uh, we want, our desire is to be an encouragement to you as you uh, go through your life, your spiritual walk. Join us at 5, continue in Revelation. Have a great afternoon. afternoon. Keep redeeming time and look into Jesus. You're dismissed. Thank you.